I have already demonstrated the Vino for you guys, now it's time for the other signature. The gorgeous Epiphone Les Paul Custom Prophecy Jerry Cantrell in bone white. And just like his Gibson Vino, there's been a controversy surrounding this signature guitar. Is it a guitar that Jerry would use on stage? Well, I have an answer for that, but let's hear these two side by side first and then I'm gonna explain. <laughs> In 2021, Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains became an official Gibson artist. The first guitar introduced was the Les Paul Custom Vino, made in the Murphy Lab, the custom shop, aged and signed. But you can imagine that for $9,000 and only 100 made, not a lot of people got the chance to own one of these. Naturally, a couple of months later, an Epiphone version followed, the Jerry Cantrell Vino Les Paul Custom. It is one of the best Epiphone Les Paul Customs that I've ever tried. I have reviewed one of these and I'm gonna link the video above, you can check it out if you wanna know more about Jerry Cantrell's relationship with Gibson. The Epiphone Vino was no surprise, just an affordable version of his famous Gibson Les Paul Custom Vino. The big surprise followed shortly with his next signature that Epiphone introduced, the Les Paul Custom Prophecy Bone White. I'm gonna explain why was this such a big surprise and a little bit of controversy. First of all, no one expected it to be a Les Paul Prophecy with 24 frets and I am surprised to find this under the original Les Paul part of the Epiphone website, especially when it's part of the Prophecy series which are all modern guitars like the Xtura, the Flying V that I reviewed and most importantly the Les Paul Prophecy which I reviewed in two colors, the red and the black, it's around $900. Then you got the Jerry Cantrell Les Paul Custom Prophecy which costs $250 more. But let me tell you this, the Control Prophecy and the regular Les Paul Prophecy are not the same guitar. In fact, I think that Epiphone did it twice with Jerry Control's signatures. First, they've created the Ultimate Les Paul Custom with the Vino, and then they followed with the Ultimate Prophecy. If you watch my video reviews of the second generation and the third generation prophecies, you know that I am not a huge fan of these guitars because of the 24 frets. The distance between the pickups, the position of the bridge just throws me off. The Les Paul Custom and for example the Vino is the perfect guitar for me. So me not liking the Prophecies is purely subjective, but I can be objective too. But I appreciate the Prophecies for what they are, they are modern Les Pauls. My first guitar was a second generation Les Paul Prophecy, I'm gonna link that video above. 
A couple of things I didn't like about it. First of all, it had a rosewood fingerboard with 14 inch radius. Second, I didn't like the shape of the headstock. And third, I was not a huge fan of the black, blue and red finishes available. In 2020, Epiphone introduced the Inspired by Gibson collection and with it came the third generation of the Prophecy that took care of two of my problems. They have ebony fingerboards and 12 inch radius. Now here's the thing about the Prophecy, I cannot complain about the 24 frets. I don't like them but they are what make the Prophecy what it is. No point of making it 22 frets, it's just gonna be a Les Paul custom. My second problem was solved back in 2020 when Epiphone introduced the Inspired by Gibson collection and with it brought back the Kalamazoo style of the headstock. Last but not least, the finishes. The second generation was gloss but I didn't like the colors, the third generation was satin which I hate and I didn't like the cutaways in the back. And here is where the Jerry Control signature is important for me. It brought back the custom specs into the Prophecy series. The full thickness body of the first and second generation with gloss finish. And I have no excuses now, in one of my last videos reviewing the third generation Les Paul Prophecies, I've said that once Epiphone makes it a gloss finish, either a full thickness body or with the colorways, with the Kalamazoo headstock, an ebony board and 12 inch radius, and include a case, it's gonna be the ultimate prophecy. That is exactly what the Jerry Control Bone White Les Paul Custom Prophecy is in my books, the ultimate Les Paul Custom Prophecy. The way I see it, there are two ways of viewing the Les Paul Custom Prophecy Bone White. First, as a Jerry Control signature, and the second is as a Les Paul Prophecy. Let's start with the Jerry Control side of things. First of all, yeah, it is a custom, it has the diamond on the headstock, it has the Jerry Control truss rod cover, the diamond inlays, it is a full thickness, it has the JJ logo on the back, but that's pretty much what's relating it to Jerry Control. I admit the circle and diamond inlays are pretty cool, they are Jerry's design, but in my opinion the Prophecy doesn't say Jerry Control enough. It has 24 frets opposed to the 22, it has active fishman pickups opposed to the passive pickups that Jerry is mostly known for. So what I would do is compare the Prophecy Les Paul Custom Jerry Control to the regular Les Paul Prophecy. And let's do that. First remember what I told you about the finish, the Jerry Control has the polyurethane lacquered finish which makes it glossy. The regular Les Paul Prophecy has a satin finish, they both have nickel brushed hardware, they both have Fishman pickups, they both have 24 frets. But the ebony fingerboard on the Jerry Cantero Prophecy is much higher grade than the regular one on this Prophecy. It is brownish here and a little bit cheaper looking. Another big difference is the custom side of the specs of the Jerry Cantero, it has a double bound full thickness body. The first and second generation prophecies were customs as well. The third generation has a full thickness body, but it has a lot of colorways and especially this one near the neck joint, where this, the custom, has the regular neck joint, no cutaway. Another huge difference is the neck. The control has the gloss finished, artist profile, D-shaped slim taper neck, where the regular prophecy has the asymmetrical satin finished neck. Both prophecies have the Grover Rotomatic Locking Tuners and the back of the Jerry Control shows the only thing that you cannot remove, the JJ logo under the lacquer. If you're not a huge Jerry Control fan, look at the prophecy from the front. An empty bell, you just swap out the Jerry Control bell for a regular one and you got a gorgeous bone white regular prophecy. Is it the ultimate prophecy though? Well, that depends. For me it definitely is because I like full thickness bodies, gloss finish, and dark black fingerboards. I am also a huge fan of this bone white color. But if you like satin finishes, if you like cutaways on the back, if you like the red tiger, yellow tiger or the black finish, this is the prophecy for you. The bone white comes with a hard shell case but there's a $250 difference. To sum things up, I think the bone white Jerry Control prophecy is aimed towards prophecy fans more than Jerry Control fans. Simply because Alice and Cantrell fans are used to seeing Jerry play his wine red more on stage than the bone white. Yes, he plays the Gibson version more, but the Epiphone looks close enough. I think that's about to change though, and let me show you why. Last night I saw this post on social media. It's Jerry's official Instagram and he has some interesting information about his upcoming tour. I followed this information in Jerry's official website and sure enough the Jerry Cantrell Brighton Tour 2023. It's a US tour with 28 dates, you can buy the tickets from the official website and there's a VIP section for every show. 
Here's where it gets interesting. The VIP section includes this Jerry Cantrell stage played guitar, limit one per show, price $5,500. But that's a VIP pass, you're not just paying for the $1,150 guitar, you're paying for Jerry Cantrell stage played guitar. This means that with the pass you have backstage meet and greet with Jerry, bring a guest, one Jerry Cantrell signature Epiphone guitar played at your show and signed by Jerry Cantrell. Which is pretty cool, he will be playing one at every show and then sign and sell it, provided that somebody buys it of course. As I already mentioned, there are 28 dates on his tour. The first two are not yet available for VIP access, meaning that he's probably still waiting for the guitars to come, but he will have 28 available guitars to sign and sell to fans. He will raise the popularity of the Bone White and we will probably start seeing these show up on eBay. As usual, before I start reviewing the guitar, I'm gonna give you guys the official listing of the Jerry Control Bone White so it doesn't get lost in time when the website discontinues it. Here we have the specs and I'm gonna quickly go through them. You can pause and read them at any time, starting with the body, neck, hardware, electronics, and the rest. Now let's start with the review of the Bone White. Yeah, the factory setup is not gonna cut it. Over 325 millimeters, 350, come on guys. The treble side is over 2, they are not even trying. I'm assuming that the truss rod hasn't been touched, the string action is too high from the bridge, I'm gonna have to do a full setup again. Maybe I was a bit too harsh when I was reviewing the regular prophecies, I've said that the Epiphone workers don't know how to put strings on locking tuners. For example, you're not supposed to wrap the string around the tuning post. It is a locking tuner after all, but there has been some arguments that this way is safer during transport, so I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. I guess it's easier and safer like that so the strings don't slip and people are supposed to put them on the right way when they get the guitar. And yeah, same like on the regular prophecies, these are not locked from the back. I guess this is the way that Epiphone workers put strings on locking tuners. It's not a mistake. And just to show you that I'm appreciative and not being too hard on the Epiphone workers, the screws on the three-way switch are seem to be done pretty well here. So job well done. Oh, oh, never mind. Before I start, I always clean up or freshen up guitars, even if they're brand new. They always look better as soon as I finish with them. They have been sitting in a box, this one in particular from 2021. So I'm gonna polish the frets with frying, I'm gonna oil the fingerboard. And I'm seeing a lot of marks, is that a glue residue from the fretwork or something like that? I'm gonna try and clean it up. So this guitar will definitely benefit from my cleaning and freshening up. And this is where I started messing around and turned it into a game. Aim for the circle through the camera screen. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, here, yeah, let's do this too, come on, ah, ah I missed, god damn it, Carl, <laughs> no, no, oh no, oh, woo, woo. come on, here we go, the fingerboard is nice and oiled, cleaned, the frets are polished so we can crack on with the specs, we got multiple piece mahogany body, plain maple cap, Full thickness bound body, set neck construction, mahogany neck, multiple pieces, ebony fingerboard, 24 jumbo frets, 12 inch radius. The Kalamazoo headstock with the diamond, automatic locking tuners, Grover, Graftech nut, a set of Fishman Fluence pickups. Epiphone lock tone, locking bridge and a tailpiece. I'm gonna measure the pickups in a second, we have a three way switch for them. And the controls are bridge volume, neck volume, bridge tone, neck tone. The pots are push-pull and control the different voicings of the Fishman pickups. This one is the split for the bridge pickup. This is the split voicing for the neck pickup. The tone pots in the down position are the default modern voicing of the Fishman pickups. When you pull on them, they are the vintage PAF voicing. I'm gonna be playing on the vintage PAF setting on the bridge pickup when I'm comparing with the Vino. And this one controls the modern versus the vintage PAF voicing for the neck pickup. Check out this brushed nickel knurled metal knobs, they are the same on the Prophecies. They have this asymmetrical relief on the top and are pretty cool and easy to operate. They are pretty fast to rotate to and sturdy in place. Measuring the Fishman proprietary set, as expected they are pretty hot. The bridge position measures 20.7k ohms. Switching over to the neck, let's wait until it settles down. A little bit hotter at 215 
the middle position should be somewhere in between. Sure enough, 10, 44. And now I want to demonstrate that switching between the different voicings in the Fishman pickups don't actually affect the readings of the multimeter. Now I'm activating the split voicing and you can see the reading doesn't get split in half. Here's the modern versus vintage, same reading, so these are just digital voicings. The good old trusty Epiphone lock tone in brushed nickel to match the rest of the hardware. It has individual saddles held by a single spring, metric adjusted by thumb wheel and flathead screwdriver. Brushed nickel Epiphone lock tone tailpiece as well, these are pretty neat when you're stringing a guitar, they stay in place. Before I start talking about the body construction, I want to discuss the bone white color. It is called bone white for a good reason and you don't see it until you do this. Introducing the Alpine White Epiphone Les Paul Custom. And you see the difference? The Alpine White is so much whiter, the bone white is greyish. It's literally bone color. It is a huge difference that you don't notice in any light situation. Here are the backs, clearly a difference between both colors. Pretty cool, huh? Let me know in the comment section which color do you prefer, the Alpine White or the Bone White. There's a little bit of a difference in the color of the binding as well. The one on the Prophecy is a little bit greener, on the Les Paul Custom is yellowish. You see it? And since we've already disturbed the peaceful sleep of the Les Paul Custom Alpine White, let me show you the difference between the Prophecy and the Les Paul Custom. The main difference is that the Les Paul Custom has 22 frets, the Prophecy has 24. This greatly affects the position of the tailpiece, the bridge, the distance between the pickups, the positioning of the neck. Even though both of these guitars have a 24.75 inch scale length, they feel quite different. You can't properly see the differences on pictures, but believe me, when you hold both guitars, they feel quite different. Particularly, the pickup spacing is throwing me off a lot. Here's that difference in pickup spacing, 46.5 for the Prophecy. And the Les Paul Custom, 58.5, that's a substantial difference. Another big difference in construction, this time with the regular Prophecy. The Jerry Cantrell is a full thickness, double bound body. The third gen Prophecy is full thickness as well, but it has a lot of comfort colorways for the belly, for the neck. If you want to know more about the construction of the Les Paul Prophecy Red Tiger, check out my video. Another huge difference that I've noticed is the quality of the ebony used for the fingerboard. It's much more higher grade on the Jerry Control signature. Feels better, looks better on the bone white, as it should, for the ultimate prophecy. And here it is in all its glory, the full thickness double bound body of the prophecy. This is not new, the first and the second generation of the prophecies had it, it returns for the Jerry Control signature. A lot of people including me were not fans of the big colorways that the third generation has, the neck axis, etc. We like our full thickness bodies. Obviously no poker chip and no pick guard for the bone white prophecy, I think it's a good aesthetic choice, looks good combined with all of the brushed nickel hardware etc. I can definitely see why it is so appealing to a lot of people. Plus the fact that it's not too much in your face as a signature guitar, I mean these circle and diamond cool mother of pearl inlays, you cannot directly associate them with Jerry Control even though they were designed for him. You can easily swap out the Jerry Control signature bell as well. It's just a cool white prophecy. Here's the gorgeous ebony fingerboard. Don't pay attention to the uneven spots. I've just oiled this fingerboard and the oil hasn't dried evenly. And as I already mentioned, it's pretty nice looking and I think it's much more higher grade. A little bit brown here, but overall it's pretty dark. Darker than the prophecy, the regular prophecy boards, which is always a plus for me. It is bound by this single ply binding with black side dot inlays. I couldn't find any flaws in the binding of the neck, so job well done Epiphone. 24 jumbo frets, same as on the Prophecy, and I must say the fret work is pretty good as well. I wanna check out another Prophecy to see if it's a fluke. Now it's a good time to check out these so called circle in diamond inlays. And upon closely inspecting them, I think that's mother of pearl. Yeah, that's not pearloid, that's mother of pearl. It reacts to the light. Pretty lively. Usually these kinds of materials are reserved for high class uh, guitars like the Gibson Les Paul Custom. Job well done Epiphone. The nut seems to be done okay, not exactly flush with the binding of the neck and the headstock, but I'll give it a pass. The Kalamazoo headstock has a black veneer, 5 ply binding around it. 
On it, we have the custom diamond and the Epiphone logo, both of which I think are Mother of Pearl as well. Not the highest grade of Mother of Pearl as I demonstrated in my Vino review, but they are pretty damn good for an Epiphone. Grover automatic locking tuners. Here's what the truss rod cavity looks like, two-way adjustable truss rod in it, covered with this traditional Epiphone belt, three screws, two ply and the Jerry Cantrell logo on it, Jerry's name, with pretty good handwriting and Jerry himself has a pretty nice handwriting and we've, as we've seen on the Gibson Vino commercial. I personally would keep this on. Now I'm gonna measure the neck and I'm gonna do it like a bone white versus regular prophecy thing, 43 for the bone white. The regular prophecy 42.8 millimeters, 52.5 versus 53.3 for the regular prophecy. Thickness of the first fret 20.5 on both guitars, but remember the regular prophecy has an asymmetrical neck profile. Thickness of the 12th fret 23 millimeters versus 23.2 on the regular prophecy. Here's a bit of a surprise: 49.4 thickness for the bone white where the regular Prophecy has a body thickness of 50mm but remember it has a lot of colorways in the back. Luckily for Jerry and for Les Paul users the third generation of Prophecies come with a 12 inch radius unlike the first and the second that had 14 inch. 12 is what we Les Paul guys like. Even though they measure similar I know for a fact that this one is asymmetrical on the regular Prophecy, this has the artist profile which is D shaped, they feel quite different. I see the artist profile is a little bit more rounded off towards the 12th fret. The regular Prophecy feels like an asymmetrical neck profile, this one just feels like a 60 slim taper D shape. Also it has a gloss finish so it feels totally different. Feels a little bit thicker and flatter than the Les Paul Vino. The output jack looks like original strap button here and one in the front as well. Here's the neck joint and the binding around it and I've just noticed a couple of white spots on the binding. They stand out because it's greenish and as soon as you see a spot like this, you notice it. Fortunately it's in a place that you're not gonna be seeing a lot when playing because it's facing down and your hand is here most of the time, but here it is from another angle, the front side of the binding is a little bit white as well, so you might consider this as a QC problem. On to the mahogany neck which usually on high grade Epiphones is one piece mahogany with separately glued neck heel over here. No high fret access colorway like on the regular Prophecy doll so you're gonna have a little bit of a hard time when playing on the high frets like on most Les Pauls. If this is a problem for you go for the regular Prophecy. Then there's the neck itself, gloss finish, the artist profile, D shape that I already demonstrated for you guys, no volute, I think this is a scarf neck joint under the QC and the handcrafted in China stickers, it's supposed to be right here made of two pieces, the headstock and the neck, like on most Epiphones. The JJ logo, it's not JC because Jerry Cantrell is a junior, his father is called Jerry Cantrell as well, so JJ, Jerry Jr. I've seen his initials on his signature Friedman amps, they are JJ as well. I'm gonna weigh and demonstrate for you guys the Grover automatic locking tuners in a second. The barely visible serial number that was also under the pickup, 211115, meaning that this was made in November of 2021. The third number 15 shows that it was made in the Queen Dao Chinese factory. Here are the Grover automatic lockings. I'm assuming that they weigh similar to the Grovers, the regular ones on the Gibson Les Paul Custom. Let's weigh them. The whole construction with the nut, washer and screw. Actually heavier. They were 45 on the Gibson, 49 here. So these are pretty sturdy and nice high quality tuners. As promised, here's the proper way to put strings on the back locking Grover tuners. Unlock them from the back, angle the hole so it's facing towards the nut, get the string through the hole, make sure it's properly sitting on the saddle, pull it just a little bit so there's no slack left in the string like that, lock it from the back and make sure you're not using too much force or else you might damage the mechanism. When the string is locked, rotate at around 90 degrees. Don't tune it just yet, you will do that when you put all the strings on the guitar. If you remember in the beginning of the video I've showed you that the factory string height is not acceptable, it was too high so I'm gonna adjust it by the truss rod and the bridge. This is a reference table, don't take it as a perfect example. This is uh, on the back of the Music Nomad string action gauge. I usually do this for electric guitar, they are recommended for the low E, medium high action 175, high E 150. 
That's what I usually set most of my LS balls to. Not the lowest, but works for me. Then I'm gonna check the truss rod and adjust it if needed. That's why I haven't put the bell on it yet. I start by adjusting the string height from the bridge using a flathead screwdriver and I always make sure that the strings are a little bit slackened, otherwise I'm putting a lot of stress on the bridge when rotating the struts. It puts too much stress on the saddles as well. I've adjusted the string height or the so-called action to my preference and remember some people might like it high, other might like it low, but uh, the general rule is for a guitar to be able to take a low action, the fretwork needs to be immaculate. If you have unlevel frets, and have it set with a low action, they will generate a fret buzz. I'm able to do the setup simply because this prophecy seemed to be done pretty well, doesn't have any problems, no unlevel frets, so I can easily set it up. But if you have any problems, get it to a proper guitar tech. After I adjust the string height, I tune the guitar to the tuning that it's gonna be in and check the truss rod by using the Music Nomad truss rod gauge. The way I do it is first I put on the first fret capo here which is pressing on the 6th string first fret and then I press on the 12th fret with my other hand. Of course you need both your hands for that. Then I'm using this tool which is specifically made for electric guitar, it has for acoustic and for bass as well and I insert it here on the 6th fret while pressing on the 12th and the fret capo is pressing on the 1st. So the rule is this, when you insert this thin metal gauge, especially for electric guitar, if it is touching too much between the string and the fret, it means that you have to loosen the truss rod. If the string is lightly touching it, you're okay. If there's no touch at all, you have to tighten the truss rod. It's a pretty good tool and it seems to work for me. Luckily, this particular truss rod didn't need any adjustments, so we're good. I've adjusted the string height, the truss rod is okay, I'm gonna put the bell back on and, and then I'm gonna work on the height of the pickups. Remember, I've lowered the string, so I have to readjust the pickups. The recommended pickup height on Gibson Les Paul guitars is 332 on the bass side of the strings and 116 on the treble side. So what I'm gonna have to do is raise it a little bit on the treble side and lower on the bass side. There we go. This is also a matter of personal preference, depends on the pickup and you can adjust it the way you like it by ear. The general rule being that the further from the strings the pickup is, you're gonna lose some high end and some gain. It's gonna get muffled. Basically what you're doing is you're moving the magnets further away from the strings, so this is a normal reaction. Raise it too high and you're gonna have a screechy, gainy sound. You gotta find the balance, the sweet spot. After finishing with all of the adjustments, I tune to the desired tuning and I check the intonation. You gotta keep one thing in mind though before intonating. If this was a fresh set of strings, I wouldn't intonate them right away. You have to wait for at least a day for the strings to settle. So I usually wait for a day or two and then I adjust the intonation from the individual settles on the bridge. After I am done with all of the adjustments that I showed you, I cut the strings using the Music Nomad Grip Cutter. Even though I'm not sponsored by Music Nomad, I love their stuff and I use everything they have. Hey Music Nomad, pay attention to me guys. I love this brand because most of their stuff is multifunctional. For example, you see the Cradle Cube, it turns into a compartment that I store my tools in. Now I'm gonna quickly show you the case. It's absolutely identical to the one on the Vino, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. One, two, three, four latches, a leather handle, the Jerry Cantrell logo, the Epiphone logo, and the grey lining inside. The compartment for accessories, yeah I've written Prophecy on a note to distinguish between both cases. Check out my Vino review for the full information about the case. The Jerry Control Prophecy weighs exactly 3700 grams or 8.15 pounds. Now let's weigh one of the regular Prophecies. It weighs 3645 grams or 8.03 pounds. Pretty close to the bone white. Because even though it has full thickness body and no cutaways, it has the ultra modern weight relief. Which obviously works because even with the gloss finish, no cutaways, it's almost the same weight as the regular Prophecy. Now let's hear it.
Is the Jerry Cantrell Les Paul Custom Prophecy Bone White a good guitar? Yeah, it definitely is. Is it the ultimate prophecy? Well, that depends. If you're a fan of gloss finish, full thickness bodies, double bound bodies, it's gonna be your ultimate prophecy. I'm a huge fan of this combination, the gloss finish, the bone white color, the inspired by Gibson Kalamazoo headstock. I like the fact that it's subtle as well, it's not in your face Jerry Cantrell signature, you can easily remove that truss rod bell. For me personally, that's the ultimate combination prophecy. The Kalamazoo headstock, the ebony fingerboard, 12 inch radius, full thickness, body, double bound. I know that it's $250 more than the regular Les Paul Prophecy, but you get what you pay for. You get the hard shell case, you get the artist profile neck. However, if you don't like 24 fret guitars, go for the Vino or the regular Les Paul Custom Epiphone. Because even with the same scale length, 24.75 inches, the Prophecy feels way different than the regular Les Paul Custom. My advice as usual, if you've never tried a Les Paul with 24 frets, make sure you try one before you buy or at least be able to return it in 14 days or whatever the website tells you. In any case, the Jerry Cantrell Les Paul Custom Prophecy Epiphone is the ultimate prophecy in my books. If you like what you saw, order one.